uh, Reverend Dr. Alfonso Wyatt, who is dear friends of Richard's, were integral to the planning of this evening. Uh, most of you are friends of PACE, but those for you who are new to PACE, the Partnership for After School Education exists to improve the quality of programs and opportunities available to young people living in poverty in New York City. We do this by working with 1,600 community-based organizations throughout the city, about 70 colleges and universities, corporate partners, foundation partners, and others all who have the goal of improving life for young people in New York City. And uh, we are delighted to be able this evening to really think back uh, and remember and celebrate where a lot of our current view of the youth services in New York City began. Bill Chan reached out a couple months ago and said that it had been on his list to establish a Richard Murphy Leadership Award. And we were delighted to, to be able to be part of that. I think Commissioner Chong thought that in part Richard set the foundation for all the commissioners that followed him and that is quite a system that has been built today. This year we wanted to have a special awards ceremony. In future years, many of you know, uh, PACE has an annual PACE Setter Awards Gala and we will always have a Richard Murphy Leadership Award which will now be really a lifetime achievement award for those who have been in this field for a long period of time. I'm delighted that we are joined this evening by colleagues from DYCD, DOE, the Manhattan Borough President's offer, Office, the Young Men's Initiative, Beacon Program alumni, Reedland and Harlem Children's Zone staff and alums, youth serving leaders past and present, philanthropy and corporate partners, and a particular shout out to my PACE Board of Directors with whom we, none of this does happen, and uh, Richard Sheff, who is the chair of our board. Richard, hand up something. Thank you. Uh, tonight's program, you have the agenda on your seats. Uh, we are videotaping the whole presentation, so people have that available to them. But we've also arranged for a videographer to be down the hall who would be um, available to capture your memories of Richard Murphy and also your thanks and appreciation of Mayor Dinkins. So with that, it's an honor to be in this room tonight with so many people who care deeply about all of the human beings in our city. It's a complicated time in our country, and seeing you all is both comforting and inspiring. I moved to New York City in 1980, but Mayor Dinkins was the first New York City that I felt a personal connection to. I, of course, voted for him twice. <laughs> if only. I always felt that both the issues, the issues that he addressed and the respectful and caring manner in which he addressed them made me proud to be a New Yorker. His ongoing commitment to providing opportunities and basic needs to all New Yorkers and his deep commitment to the role young people can play in the continued vitality of this great city make him so deserving of this honor this evening. When I moved professionally from Wall Street to the Fund for the City of New York 25 years ago, Richard Murphy was a frequent presence, often meeting with the folks at the Youth Development Institute. His values, vision, leadership, and enthusiasm confirmed to me that I had indeed voted for a great mayor. But it also confirmed that I'd made a great change in my career, and it found my calling. Seeing Richard's unbridled energy in subsequent years in conversations at Pace and elsewhere confirmed time and again his remarkable role in transforming the after-school field and the lives of young people. So tonight, let's remember a great man, let's honor an extraordinary leader, and let's celebrate all of the people in this room who have spent decades enriching the lives of New York City's children. To start us off, if I may ask Sister Paulette, Jeff, Jeff Canada, and Jim Marley to come up and remember a great man. Thank you. So when Allison first asked me to do this, I said, I certainly can't do it alone. Because one of the things about Richard is that Richard knew how to build a team of compassionate, caring, strategic people. And I can't think of anybody who helped move the agenda strategically better than Jim and Jeff. So Jim's going to start us off. Uh, we were, I think, allotted five or ten minutes, and I just said to Allison, you're going to have to get the hook, because once, <laughs> once we start with our Richard Murphy stories, there's no end to this night. All right, thank you, Paulette. 
So let me start with one story. It's actually, I just told the mayor this story. Uh, Richard was really one of my greatest friends in life. And I spent all this day thinking about him, remembering stories. As I came here tonight, I see people, I remember another story. So my mayoral story is I'm in my office in the Bronx and I get a call out of the blue, I gotta talk to you, gotta talk to you. What is it? He says, I think they're gonna offer me a job as youth commissioner of New York City. What? Yeah. <laughs> so I prize myself on my political acuity. So I said to Richard, you're out of your mind. <laughs> he says, and he was like, well, why would that be? I said, they, they would never pick someone like you, ever. He says, they're just dangling this as like a little, you know, liberal. It's not going to be, don't get you up, forget about it. And besides, I continued, you would be a disaster <laughs> because you just like run rampant. You don't like follow rules. You'll stumble into political government. You'll make enemies everywhere. It's idiotic. Forget about it. So I get a call three days later. I got the job. I wanted to speak at my going away party. <laughs> that was Richard in a nutshell. So I was never so happy to be wrong. And I was telling the mayor, he was so happy in that job. And he was so proud to represent you. And he took it at a hard time with all the stuff in Crown Heights. And I was going to say Ryan's Crown but he was, no, no, they were not Ryan. They were disturbances. He was, Richard was very, so deeply, deeply honored to be here. Uh, so I want to say just three things about Richard. Uh, <clears throat> he was a very unusual man, as you know. And each of you, each of you knew a part of Richard. And the strange thing is when we got together at the end of his life, we all knew the same part, but in different ways. He had an incredible ability for friendship, uh, uh, to pay attention to you, to make you feel important, to wangle and dangle you, and to deeply move your heart. He did this everywhere with the widest assortment of people you ever knew. And that was such an incredible gift. And the other part about Richard is that he did it for cause. You know, at, at, his, uh, at his funeral mass, uh, did, uh, Fred got a wonderful Jesuit priest to speak, and he spoke about the Beatitudes. You know, Blessed are those who seek justice. They'll see the face of God. And what he said about Richard was that he didn't just believe that, that that teaching inhabited him. Such an interesting phrase. That whole life inhabited him. And he was like that. He was absolutely like that. So he did so much good. He was like that. He was also deeply, deeply crazy. <laughs> you know, and you know that. And, I, can I get an amen? Yeah, the hands go up. All right? And, and I say that, I say that because our favorite mutual character was Max Bialystok of the producers, which, which many of this audience ended up in the movie because of this man. So he had the ability to take something fantastic like Max Bialystok and this entrepreneur of dealing with things. I just met Jessica May, say, are the fish still swimming? The fish that he introduced into high school without permits, without degrees, tilapia, they're still swimming. This is the man. So really, it is, it is a great gift to have, see a person of passion and justice and friendship and love to stay at it, to beat this city at its own game, to turn it on its head and make it love him. Who can do that? And he did all those things in space. So I just really want to honor his memory. I feel him in the room. I see him. Every one of you... And each of us carries a little Richard with us wherever we go, and we're all better for it. So that's my memory yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I want to go back in history a little bit and tell you a little how we all got connected. So this, again, was the Richard Murphy brainstorm. Um, we were at a meeting. I, I don't even remember what the meeting was, but those were the days when no one really cared about neighborhood services. Um, Kafka was all about child welfare and foster care and removing kids and uh, DYCD was a tiny little program at the time. So Richard had this idea that like-minded people should get together and should form a coalition. And so the coalition, the Neighborhood Family Services Coalition, was born. We had some wonderful, wonderful opportunities. Why? Because we had Richard's creative genius. We um, took 400 kids to Albany one day when nobody else was doing that. We uh, fought City Hall left and right in the most creative ways, including one time when we were trying to get more money for preventive services 
and the match for family counseling in the community as a of city money compared to state money was 7525. So what did we come up with? Richard had the idea of writing a letter with a quarter nailed onto it that we sent to every city council member. Another time, it was cans of spinach. The courage. The courage. How did Richard get all of this done? He was the best friend of every administrative support person in the city. He sent Valentine's homemade Valentine's cookies, and Jeff is still yeah, continuing <laughs> that. He had both a creative genius and the really strong strategic eye to see what could really be. So before anybody was really into Youth Voice, Richard was into Youth Voice. He started Youthline America. He started it at DYCD. He continued it after he left. He had, he constantly talked about Ruby on the Rails, right? Ruby on the Rails. That is some very advanced computer technology software that nobody else in the city had heard about. Richard knew all about it. He, his creative genius combined with his big heart was really extraordinary. So one other short story. One day at a coalition meeting, Ernesto Loperena, who was running the Council on Adoptab Adoptable Children, came in with what ACS then had called the Blue Book. And these were children who were freed for adoption but hadn't been identified, foster or birth adoptive parents hadn't been identified. Richard was just thumbing through the book while the meeting was going on and landed on the fact right then and there that he was going to adopt this 14 year old boy named Noel. Noel today graduated, has a master's degree, has the highest clearances from the Pentagon. He is a computer whiz and is now living in California. Asia, Asia, his, his uh, younger half-sister, is living in D.C. and is in a stable relationship and has just given birth to her first child. She's in her early 30s. And the middle, little boy's middle name is Murphy. So she would have been here this evening, and we promised to keep her up to date, but he, the little one has uh, bronchitis, so she wasn't able to bring him up. But that's Murphy. He had creative ideas, he never asked permission, and he acted on them. And before I turn it over to Jeff, today we're faced with one of the most unusual situations that our country has ever faced. And I think that all of us here have to carry on the legacy that Richard has left, that he has shown the way, he has shown a spotlight on what needs to be done for young people, and it's up to us to ask forgiveness and not permission to carry on his legacy. Uh, thank you, Paulette. And, and Jim, thank you for saying what I was scared to say, that Richard Murphy was crazy. Uh, because you all got to know his craziness every now and then. But I lived with that man for seven years. Uh, and so this is how... This is how I met Murphy, and it was an omen. Uh, I was coming down from Boston back to New York. I hadn't been in New York for uh, about 10 years. And I had a meeting set up, and I got lost. This was August. And I was late. And I just, anybody knows me, I hate to be late. And I am running through Manhattan trying not to be late for this meeting in a suit and tie. And I get to the office, and I'm drenched with sweat, and I'm thinking, this guy is going to take one look at me and say, this guy's got to be on drugs or something. What is he doing? He's all wet. So I come there. I'm a half an hour late, and I'm getting my whole story together for Murphy. He comes out. He says, hi, how you doing? Come on, let's go for a walk. <laughs> and I was like, I wanted to explain. I had this whole thing. How I was going to explain him. He could care less. We walked up to 117th Street and Lenox Avenue. During the walk, now I'm wondering, I haven't been in Harlem in a long time, and I'm walking with this white man in Harlem, <laughs> and I'm thinking, is this safe? I'm like, well, he don't look scared. <laughs> and then he says to me, you see this watch, Jeff? 
and it was a Mickey Mouse watch. I said, yeah. He said, oh, yeah, I got this because the last time they robbed me up here. And I thought, oh, now I'm with you? You know, he did look like a mark if you ever saw him with the bow tie. So <laughs> we get up to 117th Street, and uh, Reedland ran a feeding program uh, out of PS207, uh, and we gave away day-old bread. And there was a line all the way down the block of people, and they had run out of bread. Uh, and Murphy uh, just, I mean, it, this was like the biggest crisis. It was like World War III. And we, you know, Murphy, we ran across the street, stopping traffic, and we brought up all the bread from every one of those bodegas and took it over there uh, so those folks uh, could have bread and we could meet our commitment. And I said, you know, I think this guy's kind of crazy. <laughs> But I like this kind of craziness, right? I mean, here he is in Harlem, right, running around buying bread because he made a commitment to folk uh, that he was going to feed them. Now, Murphy had a lot of great ideas, but I learned the hard way. <laughs> Don't always listen to Murphy with his ideas. Um, very early on, you know, M Murphy was always, he always prepared testimony for everything. And he kept telling me, Jeff, you got to go to city council. You got to give testimony. You got to. So I said, no, I don't want these. He said, no, you got it, Jeff. No, 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 you're a very important person. I said, no, nobody really knows me. He said, no, Jeff, no, everybody knows you got to go down. So finally, I spent three days. I wrote this testimony, and I said, you sure they want No, they want to hear from you, Jeff. So I go down to City Hall, and I sign up. And I think I was about two paragraphs into my testimony when they said, okay, who's next here? Can we go? <laughs> that was it. And I just looked at Murphy like, what? He said, no, it was good experience. It was good experience for you. Uh, Mur Murphy did allow me uh, one sort of experience of karma. Now, uh, Commissioner, uh, DYCD is a changed agency since Murphy was there. But Murphy, you know, Murphy got up in the mornings. Every morning, he must have been awake around 4.30 in the morning. He was on the phone by 5. By the time I got into the office, at 7, 7.30, he was already had 15 conversations he had had. And that continued. That, when I would leave, he would still be making his evening calls, and he did that every single day. And you know when Murphy had really ticked you off, right? When he had gone too far, because he would bring you a cheesecake, right? <laughs> he made great cheesecake. And if you got a cheesecake, you Murphy knew he had gone too far with you. Uh, but... Uh, People, because Murphy always outworked everybody, outorganized, he had a lot of enemies, but everybody was scared to take him on. Well, guess who they weren't scared to take on? <laughs> so I'm going to DYCD. You know, we always did everything at the last minute. Murphy was always like running to catch a taxi to get it in. I know, I know you know, you had a few of those experiences. And so I'm going down to DYCD, but they hated us down there. They just, they just disliked the fact that this guy always seemed to be able to get his way and he would work around them. So when I got in there, they would just, they always treated me terrible. They'd make me wait. They threw a contract at me one day and I just wanted to get revenge. And then guess what happened? Murphy became commissioner. <laughs> oh, oh, when Murphy became commissioner, I strolled right down near the folk, court street. And I, I never got so much love in my whole life. They were like, oh, Mr. Canada, how are you doing? Uh, I learned, I learned a, a lot about Murphy. Uh, he was shameless in what he would do for the children. I mean, literally, we call our Valentine cookies, we call them no shame cookies. Because that's what we, we like. We had those little kids writing those little notes. We had like, like a factory line going in there. Kids sweating. I know you only have to do 40 more. Uh, <laughs> Without it. <laughs> it was. Uh, but the, the thing about Murphy was he never accepted defeat, ever. I don't care what happened. He always believed he was going to turn the tide. Uh, he believed that in the end, uh, you had to do whatever was necessary for the kids. Uh, the kids of Reedland, later for the kids of New York City. Uh, he was a great teacher. Uh, he could coin a phrase. Uh, he could present information in a way that people suddenly said, wow. Uh, and he could organize folk. Uh, I mean, there's hardly anyone here that I know that was not organized by Murphy on some mission, right? Every, every three months, we had a mission 
at the city council at Albany. We had a mission. Uh, he got those schools open with these two folk right here. Uh, those schools were not open in New York City. Uh, got those schools open now, and the whole city uh, is taking advantage of that organizing work, which happened right there at 2770 Broadway. City Project, Neighborhood Family Services Coalition, uh, and Reedland, all out of one little tiny place with a guy who worked seven days a week, uh, nonstop, uh, on behalf of this city. Uh, he was a truly great man. Uh, I can't let the moment pass without saying, uh, you know, John Best was, and I see some of John's folks here, he was part of that crew. Moises, I see some of his folks here, part of that crew. Uh, that was the golden age of youth development in New York City, right? That moment, Murphy was a leader, and we all celebrated when, when this great man, Mayor Dinkins, uh, had the wisdom to place him uh, at DYCD. Uh, all of us who cared about the children of this city celebrated uh, because we know that that guy would have literally died uh, for the kids uh, in this city. And that's why we love Murphy to this day. We really, really want to capture the stories, and um, because this needs to live on 25 years from now and other times as well. So please, there is a videographer, and we look forward to many more of those stories. This woman here will be right down the hall um, towards the end of the reception. One of the other great things that happened uh, in Maker, Mayor Dinkins' mayorality and with the, the true uh, vision and hope and kindness of Richard Murphy were the Beacons. And the Beacons programs recently celebrated their 25th anniversary. And as segue, I'd like to uh, play this video. My name is Emma, and I am nine years old. I have been at the Beacon for two years. Beacon is that sort of one-stop, holistic community resource where you can go to for anything. Um, and literally, when I worked at the Beacon, we had people coming in for everything. We'll have the mother in our GED program, the father came to our workforce program, the, the young people are in our after school program, um, different ages, so some are elementary, some are middle school. And now, you know, the, the entire family's thriving. I had no idea uh, 25 years ago that, that we would come to this day. Uh, I had confidence that what we were trying to do was good and appropriate and, uh, and we were going to be successful, but I had no idea it was going to expand the way it has, and I'm very pleased about that. In 1991, we thought that it was needed because, uh, as you may recall, we had uh, high crime rates and we had a program called the Safe Street, Safe City, subtitled Cops and Kids. And so part of the rationale was hey, we've got these buildings, bricks and mortar, already constructed, and, and yet we don't use the schools beyond the hours of instruction, and why not? I was 14, and this is 1989. Um, one of my, I had a friend that was killed. So at that point, this was his second friend that was killed in my neighborhood uh, within six months. And we were gonna retaliate. We had an intervention. The director of the community center saw me and she saw, she's like, Daryl, what's going on? I told her we went inside, all my friends went inside and we formed the youth group, Young Hope. Um, and I was the president of the youth group at that moment. And our, our mantra was turning negative anger into positive action. So we started to mobilize the neighborhood, mobilize the community. We did youth rallies, um, everything under the guise of stopping the violence and changing um, the face of our neighborhood. Well, I think part of what makes it work is that the community decides what they want to do. 
with these programs. And given the funding by the city, it's a, it's a, a win-win. By being a part of the Beacon program, we were involved in many activities where you know you yourself were able to become an advocate for your community. I think the opportunity to have a Beacon program, you know, in the neighborhood that I was in, um, provided a great advantage for me. I'm proud to be part of the Beacon. Beacon is a magical place. All right, we're gonna ignore the technology because I'll mess that up. Um, just because they're here, Daryl, Daniel, can you just stand and be recognized, please? We spend a lot of time thinking about impact and evaluation. We have these two gentlemen here. Matters. Uh, it is delightful now to uh, welcome Commissioner Bill Chong to, to, to formally honor Mayor Dinkins. Um, one of the pleasures of having Bill Chong here in this group is that he truly does not need an introduction, which means I can take my two minutes to publicly state what a wonderful commissioner he has been. The Department of Youth and Community Development has expanded, I think, beyond any dreams we had in those earliest, earliest days. It is extraordinary, reaching thousands and thousands of young people with high quality programs, with a real sense of building the communities that need to be able to be there for young people in really new and innovative and deeply impacting ways. So, so um, with many, many thanks to the commissioner, and I think he carries on and honors the tradition of Richard Murphy in his own work. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. I really want to thank Allison and Pace because I really, this really was on my bucket list as commissioner because I wanted to make sure that there was a place for a living tribute to Richard because it's, it's often um, a cliche to say we all stand on somebody else's shoulders, but in my case, in the case of every commissioner who followed in his footsteps, we really built on the foundation he laid. I think this administration, more than any, uh, thanks to the mayor, we probably built several floors. Um, it, it's truly amazing. Um, I know some of you think we need to build a few more floors, but that's, <laughs> Sister Paulette, uh, but that, that, that's for another day. Uh, and, you know, just to recap, because, you know, having served in the previous administration as a deputy commissioner, I really understand the sea change in the last four years uh, because of the mayor, Mayor de Blasio's leadership on this, because of the hard work of the DYCD staff, and because of the partnership with the nonprofit community. I mean, we have now after school programs in every middle school. Every middle school. You know, a record number of summer jobs, over almost 70,000 this past summer. Uh, we're on the way to tripling the number of beds for homeless youth in the next 18 months. And the most important thing I'm proud of is that we were able to revive the Beacon program. For, after 20 years, it languished. It was cut and cut and cut. And, you know, at one point uh, in, the, in the previous administration, we were talking about shutting down beacons. That was on the table because there was no new money. And now we have 11 new beacons. So, but all this would not have been possible if it wasn't for Richard Murphy. Because he did something that no commissioner was able to do, is get new money at a time of budget deficits. My job was easy, I have to tell you. I, I, you know, they always say the right place, right time. You know, I was fortunate to have worked with Mayor de Blasio previously, that he understood the importance of the work uh, that we were doing and that the economy cooperated. But, you know, Richard was, and the Mayor, Mayor Jenkins were faced at a time of tremendous budget crisis of crime and to be able to carve out money to launch the Beacon program. Imagine how different the world would be today if the Beacon program didn't exist. It's the foundation for a lot of our programs. He was the pioneer for youth development. So without his contribution, so I'm so thankful that uh, this award will be a living tribute to him because just as Daryl and Daniel, and you know, there are hundreds of people who went through the Beacon program who are leaders in the field today. So I think that's his true legacy. And you know, in talking about standing on other people's shoulders, I always tell people that um, I worked for four mayors, uh, one governor, one president, two Cuomos. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but you know, the first mayor I worked for was David Dinkins. And so many of us, he was the first mayor we worked for. Mayor de Blasio, first mayor he worked for. And so his legacy, we're his part of his legacy. He opened the door for us. Uh, and, you know, and by giving us the opportunity to serve the people of New York, and you see throughout government, so many people, throughout people in the nonprofit world, people who worked in the Dinkins administration who are still here today. So it's, it, to me, it was fitting that we come full circle in the first award that we presented to Mayor David Dinkins. Uh, is, oh, I, it didn't take 10 minutes. That's why I'm really fast. So Mayor Dinkins, it's my pleasure to present you this award. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> and take picture? God bless you. Yeah. Well, I'll leave it here. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's not crash. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, and I often say that uh, everyone can't be a parent, but if you don't like children, there's something wrong with you. I love kids. I truly do love children. And my bride and I, we are privileged to have a little boy and a little girl. Little boy is 63. <laughs> I call him Daddy's little fella. And his, his sister is 60. And uh, fortunately, his, his sister has two children, one of, one of whom is a girl and she got married on August 26th this year. And so I'm looking forward to, as they say, God willing, the creek don't rise, I might get to be a great grandfather. <laughs> but I am uh, so pleased to be here, uh, to, to be honored, uh, recognized in any way with my buddy Richard Murphy. He, he did, uh, I got to tell you, it, it was not easily done. And, uh, to have him in there fighting and swinging for us made all the difference. And uh, it's good that you uh, acknowledge his contribution. And to permit me to be part of it is, well, you know, that's as good as it gets. So I thank you very, very much. Uh, as my friends in South Africa say, uh, usual protocols observed when they fail to acknowledge uh, all the you important people. Each of you is important. And uh, I, I, I just like people who like other people and who like children. It, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 that's where I live. And uh, when I go home, my bride will she'll look at this award you gave me. And, 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 and she'll say, that'll look nice in your office. <laughs> And you know what that means. So, uh, but I, I'm so pleased and proud to be here tonight. Uh, Murph was a, he was terrific because when we uh, the, the Beacon program was uh, quite an effort, and uh, I get the credit for it. But uh, it was uh, people like Murph and a whole lot of others who really got the job done, and. Uh, so I'm very pleased and, and proud of that because we recognize that here you had uh, buildings uh, that were not in use beyond the usual hours of instruction. The bricks and mortar had been paid for. Why the hell not use them for good things? And so we did. And there were programs uh, designed by the community, paid for by the city, but designed by the community and it worked very, very well. It would not have worked so well had it not been for Murph. He, he was terrific. And so I thank you for permitting me to stand in his shadow. I, I truly do. Thank you very much. Thank you, my love.
Reverend Dr. Alfonso Wyatt, may I ask you to bring it home? <laughs> <laughs> Some would say that perhaps we've all kind of ventured into a part of organizers' heaven where organizers and advocates have all come together to knock on a door to see our dear brother to see our dear friend, one who has poured into, sowed seeds into so many lives and did it with a plum, did it with a, 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 a what, a plum? Yeah, I like that. Uh, <laughs> you got to trust yourself, you know? Uh, and and we all have stories and I'm hoping, and perhaps, Miss Gail, how you doing there, daughter? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Make sure we get those pictures and do whatever. So I, I was uh, told to bring it home. So that's something that a preacher loves to do. Uh, and, and to all that is here, protocol has already been established. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not recognize uh, this great uh, mayor, that 106, then we're sitting right here in terms of what you were able uh, to do. I will always remember, I started at the Fund for the City of New York the day you were inaugurated. So I always kind of kept uh, a track with that. And all of the work, the anti-violence work, the things that was able to happen, people still all over the country, they are amazed that there is no gang culture in New York City, in big old bad New York City. There's not what it is. Now, there's gangs now. I'm not trying to say it ain't. But it's not what it is in other parts of the country. Richard Murphy, where do you start? Jeff knows, you know, he, 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 he had to, Bill, how you doing, sir? He had to go in there. Uh, but we, we also got some over at the Valley uh, when he would come over there. I remember that we were playing basketball, uh, the Valley and, and Reedland. And I was driving up from Queens, and, and, and I see Richard, uh, uh, and I'm shocked because he has on a, 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 le a jogging suit. <laughs> I'm the only one that saw this. I, I, I could have been hallucinating, but he had a jogging suit. I'm driving up, and I see him from the back. I recognize his walk, and I get over there. I honk the horn. Richard turns over, and he comes by. And he got a jogging suit on and a bow tie. <laughs> uh, I said, no, no, this dude is different for real. Uh, I remember when uh, he asked me to come down to when he became commissioner. And he had a pet pee. He was, he was, he was, he was like, oh, I got to show you something. You won't believe this. I got to show you something. I said, like, what? You know, I'm thinking it's some new matrix or something. You know, he's going to show me something. And he takes me down a hallway. And he stops at a desk. And he points. He could not believe that people had refrigerators on their desktop. <laughs> And there was something about this refrigerator on people's desks, and he, Raul, Raul, oh my goodness gracious, this is this is too much for me. I'm about ready to cry. Uh, uh, he couldn't believe it when he came over to the fund. When when uh, let's just say the winds uh, changed direction, and he was uh, housed over at the fund for the city of New York. Jessica knows that's right. That's right. Uh, and every evening, around 5 o'clock, he would either come by my desk and we would go in the back. And Richard would wax eloquent, talking about Swiss Miss chocolate, hot chocolate. <laughs> he would ask me the same question. Do you think it's better with or without marshmallows? <laughs> And we would sit there and drink our Swiss Miss, just me and Richard laughing and talking. And he had that sense of humor, as you all know. He, he, he would play uh, tricks. He was one of the few people 
that knew. I, I went to Howard University and on the corner of Georgia Avenue in Florida, there was uh, uh, Ben's uh, Chili Bowl and wings and mo wings. Richard had to be the only white man I know that knew about how good them beans, how good them wings. And he would always talk about it. He would always ask me. So he would play tricks, as we all know he did. And I thought I could keep up with him. I mean, uh, I, I can be funny when I have to, but I could not keep up with this man. And one of the artists that he loved, was M.C. Hammer. <laughs> and, 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 and he found a way to mail me an a M.C. Hammer album that I opened up. I, I could not believe that he was able to pull this off. Richard sold into all of us. Richard had a special affinity for young men of color, I'm looking at him, I'm looking at him. You don't have no idea in the room that Richard gave a chance to, gave a chance to the karate man over there that came down from, from, from up, the, up the way. Uh, when you talked about coming to your interview, Sweaty, I was at Reedland one day. This young man was coming to interview. I don't know what happened. He took off his shoes, was running down Broadway, trying to get there. You remember that? And and I'm thinking, I'm thinking that uh, Murphy was going to call the cops on this dude. Because to me, you know, I thought he went over the deep end. And Murphy hired him. Not only did he hire them, I saw this same young man about three months ago. I'm talking about all three piece down. I mean, just, just, uh, yes, how are you, uh, Mr. Wyatt? Huh? <laughs> I said, now Murphy saw something that perhaps few others did. When I walked into this building, I said, Murphy, you in here? Scadding arts. I was looking for Murphy. <laughs> the, uh, I think he would think that this is ironic in a sense of where he came from and what he meant. He introduced me to advocacy along with Sister Paulette, along with Jean Thomas's, may God rest her soul, um, Bob Marley over there. <laughs> I always cry, I know his name is not Bob. <laughs> We were able, and I, I, I think you're absolutely right. That was uh, the, the, the high point, I think, of youth development in terms of where it was, the leaders, these young people, all of the young people that knew Murph, raise your hand. They're all around here. Yeah, they're sitting here. One of the things in closing, on the 15th anniversary that we had of the Beacons, became very clear that perhaps an unintended consequence was that many leaders of color got a chance to be in charge of something, got a chance to make decisions. Many have gone on and went into the city council. I can tell you there are at least six or seven people in city council who were, are, are Beacon members. Anywhere you go, you see Beacon members. We have Jenny Soleil McIntosh over here. She's now at New Visions, but was the associate commissioner. That part of that job was to roll out the Beacons in those first 10. 10 would have been good for all of us. We would have thought that was a miracle. But it went on. And a, there's nothing like a great idea. The last Murphy story at least from this person. There was a meeting um, up at the cathedral in Synod Hall. That was the meeting place. Synod means meeting. <laughs> and, and the Neighborhood Family Services Coalition was there. And all of the youth workers were there. And we were protesting the fact that there was no cost of living allowance no cola you know i thought that was soda i was like nobody can get no cola I was like what, what, what kind of world is this so 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 we're sitting there 
And next to Murphy is an undressed mannequin sitting there at the table. And Murphy is just conducting the meeting. <laughs> Everybody saw that mannequin. You remember that, Mrs. Paulette? Everybody saw this mannequin, but nobody said anything because who knew, you know, maybe it's going to talk, but who knew? And maybe about halfway in, Murphy starts railing that youth workers did not get a raise and that we were entitled to it, we should get it. And then he looks towards the mannequin and says, look, he gave the shirt off his back. (laughs) 